Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. I'm Andrew Musgrove, joined by John Gibson. It's time for another episode of Let's Talk About. And today we're going to focus on Fabian Share. What does the future hold for the big centre back? Fantastic season last season, but he is coming into the last year of his contract. And at the age of 32, what does the future hold from at Newcastle United? John, welcome back. You doing well? Yes, I'm good. Absolutely so. Good, good. Are you enjoying the Euros so far? Well, not as much as I enjoy NUFC, but uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it was England, terrific first half, and then what on earth happened to them? Um, but that's Southgate's problem. I'm a little bit more concerned and interested in Eddie Howe's problems, or lack of problems, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, we are recording this on the day of the Premier League uh, fixture release uh, day and Newcastle have got to uh, will start their campaign at home to Southampton so are you happy with that one John? Yes absolutely so I mean we could have started uh, away to Manchester City I'll take Southampton on the opening day and we're not going to get too scared of that and uh, have, have you thought of this one welcome back Ryan Fraser <laughs> he's, he's bound to get a terrific reception from Eddie Howe and even more so from the crowd, wouldn't you think? Yes, I'm certain of that. Um, let's start then on today's topic. As I said, it is Fabian Scher. And a few people might be scratching their heads and thinking, what are you on about talking about his future at Newcastle United? But there is no getting away, John, that he is uh, nearing the end of his career. His contract does expire in 2025. I don't think there's any doubt that he'll still be a Newcastle United player come the end of this window. But there are questions to be asked about his long-term future. You know, with a year on his contract, John, could you see him being offered another deal and potentially finishing his career here at Newcastle United? Yes, I could, because um, Eddie's very loyal to them that are loyal to him. Um, and we saw with people like Matt Ritchie, that when you've been a terrific servant to Eddie, uh, you get rewarded because it, it's not just a matter of are you going to be the first name on the team sheet every week. It's a matter of backup. It's a matter of what you give Monday to Friday as well as Saturday. And Shaw fits very well into that. And there was a, I mean, for the last two or three seasons with Matt, he was basically the man that come off the bench in the 85th minute, wasn't he? But he still had a future here, if you like, that he was on the payroll. And I can certainly see that happening with Shaw beyond this season, that he stays at Newcastle United, although his influence on the first team mightn't be as great. I mean, his influence on the first team has been huge. In the last two seasons, he's played 36 of the 38 Premier League games in both the last two seasons. That's how influential he has been. But there's no question that at 32, the longevity of his stay at Newcastle and the fact that Newcastle are progressing uh, season upon season, he needs competition for that place. And he also need Newcastle United needs someone who's going to take over in that position when it's not automatically Fabian. And of course, uh, they were looking at that, weren't they, with Tossin and thought they had that covered. Uh, but the Fulham boy jumped ship to stay in London and go to Chelsea. Uh, and I'm certain they will probably sign a right-sided uh, centre-half this summer. But that doesn't mean the end of Shaw. And um, what he's done for Newcastle has been absolutely terrific. Well, that is sort of the reason I picked Fabian Scher to talk about because of that chase for uh, Torsen, which ended in disappointment. Obviously, they signed Lloyd Kelly, but if he plays at centre-back, he'll play as that left-sided centre-back. And there is a big debate to whether Newcastle United need to go into the market and spend some cash on a right-sided centre-back. Now, I think the answer to that is split. I, I don't think there is a universal agreement from the fan base because people were very impressed with Fabian Chair last season. As you mentioned there, John, you know, what was the 36 games he played? He's, he, he scored, um, how many goals? He scored four goals in the Premier League last season. Of course, scored that wonderful goal in the Champions League as well. It was arguably his best season, I think, for Newcastle United. 
And for a lot of people, he's one of the first names on the team sheet come that game against Southampton. But for some, John, there is argument that Newcastle need to go out and spend on a centre-back, but that won't be cheap and that'll be a large part of their budget. How far up the list is it for you when it comes to transfer priority? Do Newcastle go out and sign a right-sided centre-back this season? And if so, how important is it that they do so? Yeah, I think they do and they should do. Um, I think it's only if you have a pecking order of signings and really you need them all. But if you have a pecking order, I think it's probably third. A right winger would be the first target because he would go immediately into the team, the right winger, unchallenged, if you like. The second choice would be a centre forward because we desperately need cover there. He wouldn't go automatically in the team like the right winger would. And the third choice would then be a right sided uh, centre half. And Eddie's thinking has already been shown with Tosson uh, almost coming here. And, um, you know, we say that it won't be cheap. And yes, I do follow that. But it was going to be for nothing. If Tosin had come, it was going to be a free transfer. We, that's the sadness of it not being him, because that would have left an awful lot of wiggle room financially if we'd got what two centre halves in without spending a penny. I know signing on fees and wages, but without actually laying out hard cash. That's not going to happen now. I don't think we're going to get a right sided centre half on um, a free transfer. That would have been well underway before now. But, you know, let's be truthful. We've moved into a different world, Andrew. This now is a different world to the one Newcastle United lived in under Ashley and latterly under Steve Bruce. This is a, a world whereby no player is beyond competition and neither should they be. Yes, Shaw has been immaculate and played 36 games out of 38. I think that he entered the frame for... Player of the Year at Newcastle last year with the really big names and obvious names like Anthony Gordon and uh, Bruno and Isaac with his 25 goals. I think the fourth competitor for with a genuine shout for Player of the Season was Shaw. Um, and, and he was as good as that. But it doesn't mean that Newcastle shouldn't go in with at least cover and somebody pushing him for his place. The same as it doesn't mean because Isaac scored, Isaac scored 25 goals, we shouldn't worry too much about his centre forward because Isaac might not be fit and, and his, his reputation suggests that he might not be fit to play 38 games in, in a season that he might is going to be injured sometime and then what. And the same, I mean, with Shaw, it is not just cover like it is for the centre forward, because Isaac's got that nailed on. It's not just covered, it's for somebody to challenge him. But wasn't that what we were talking about with Nick Pope? That, mm. you know, he, he needs to be pushed. Shaw needs to be pushed. The midfield need to be pushed, and Tenali will push them. You know, when you think of Joel and, and then Bruno, the two Brazilian boys, and Willick coming back, there's still Tenali to fit into that three. So if Newcastle are going to improve and if they're going to get into the Champions League at the end of this season, and that's got to be the aim, by the way, not just you, but the Champions League. Shy Ben's getting out, as, as I regularly say. We've got to aim for the Champions League, whether we just fall short and make one of the other European competitions, but not making Europe at all it doesn't bear thinking about. It's not on the agenda. And to make Europe... We are exposed in certain positions, and one of them's right sided centre half, where we've got no depth. Mm. So, someone coming in, is it to re replace Fabian Share or is it to compete with them? You mentioned there the right wing, and how someone comes in and they're more than likely to start from the off. But let's say Newcastle do spend 25, 30 million pounds on a centre back, whoever that might be. Come that first game of the season, against Southampton, do you foresee Fabian Cher keeping that new signing out of the side? Well, it depends who the new signing is, and we don't know that we're actually going to have one by now. But I certainly wouldn't expect the centre-forward to keep Isaac out the side. I would certainly expect a right-winger to go straight in because, um, you know, he's going to go in before Miggy and before Murphy and uh, before switching one of the left-wingers to the right. So the outside right will go straight in. Quite simply, it's the same, exactly the same situation as Pope, where you're buying a, 
a man to challenge from day one yes i accept that to challenge shah i mean we've slightly done it differently haven't we with with pope because instead of getting the nailed on keeper that on day one is going to say to pope i'm after your position and i'm after it for the southampton game as well you don't expect Trafford to do that when he when he comes, and I'm pretty certain he will come. You would expect him just to sit behind him, push him all the way, and perhaps as the season goes on, challenge him to get into the side. But but Newcastle have handled that slightly different, uh, trying to be clever and trying to, to cut the cloth according to the financial situation. What will they do with the centre-half? Tosin, for example, would have pushed Shaw on day one. Whoever got it is open to. I mean, Shaw has got a right to defend his position because he's played so flipping well. But you need him pushed. You know, the best way to get the best out of Shaw is push him. Have somebody with him that is so good that he dare not relax because his position's gone. The way for for Fabian to get rust on on his on his um, on his legs is to make him such an obvious choice for, for right side centre half that you don't know where to turn if something happens to him. He needs to be pushed at this stage of his career. And it's not being disrespectful to him on, on not appreciating what he's done. It's trying to keep up to the sky high standards he has set for us. And the only way to do that is to have somebody to challenge him. And like any player, you come to the end of your career. Look at Messi, look at Ronaldo, two of the the two greatest players in the last 10 years, the world seen. But now, you know, one of them's in America and the other one's in Saudi. They're not mainstream anymore. Forget that Ronaldo is still playing in the Euros, he's in Saudi and Messi is in America. They're not mainstream anymore. It happens inevitably to everyone. And it'll happen to Shah. It happened to Shearer. It happened to everybody that day comes in a in sport where it's a young man's game and so we do need somebody this summer i think for the right sided center half but my joe isn't it lovely to have to have fabian in the form that he's been in and isn't it startling andrew to think of the form he's been in since the new manager came because he was always a quality player but he was a different player before how come he is one of the guys that has really benefited, and there were so many of them, from the coaching. And you know what? We always talk, when we talk about the players at Newcastle that have improved under Eddie Howe, we always talk about the uh, tactically um, getting a hold of them on the training pitch, minimising their, their, what's wrong with them, maximising what's right with them. We always talk about that. But we rarely talk about what he really does give a player. And for me, you know what that is? Confidence. He, he shows his belief in that player is unwavering. He backs it up with facts and with working closely with him on the training pitch. And the player himself grows immensely. If a manager shows that he has confidence in a player, if a manager tells a player, I tell you what, you're a different class. I love you, son. You're a different class. You will do for me, etc., etc. And I think the biggest difference Shaw made, because he didn't have to tell Shaw how to play football. That's in his DNA. He, he is terrific at that. But what he was, for me, in the old regime, he was a walking mistake. He would look terrific on the ball. He would come out with the ball. He would look assured. He would look to have the passing range of a midfielder playing at centre-half. But he was a walking mistake. He would always make a mistake and it, we would be severely punished for it. That has been eliminated to a great extent out of his game. Every footballer is human. They will make mistakes, but he doesn't make them as regularly. And the biggest thing, and I think if you talk to Fabian, the thing that comes out when I listen to him is he feels so much confidence, so much belief in the present regime, uh, the players around him, knowing that they'll help dig him out and he'll dig them out. It's a whole different ball game from the existence that was Newcastle United before that. And he has benefited enormously from that. But... Also, when we keep giving 
Eddie uh, great credit for what he has done to numerous players, and we can name half a dozen. Let's also not forget to give some praise to the player himself, because he's listened, he's take, he's taken it in, and he has become a good player as a consequence. If that seed is not there in a player, you can't make a you can't make a poor player a good one. You can just bring out the best in a good player, and I think that's what has happened with Fabian and with a lot of players in Newcastle. Yeah, I mean, the list is, is quite endless, uh, given the impact that he has had on some of the players, especially some of the players whose careers he thought were kind of done and dusted at Newcastle United. And it's really interesting that you mentioned development because, I mean, the word goes that when Newcastle signed Fabian Share, he was far from uh, Rafa Benitez's first choice. Steve Bruce didn't really fancy him. And if we go through the, the, the stats um, at Newcastle United in terms of Premier League, Start 18, 19, 24 games, 19, 20, 22 games, 20, 21, 18 games, 21, 22, 25 games. And then you've got Eddie Howe really fancying them. 22, 23, 36 games, 23, 24, 36 games. So you can see there that Eddie Howe has seen something and, you know, they've really struck up a, a, a partnership and Newcastle are play, paying, uh, getting the benefits from it. Now, I think I already know your answer to this next question, John, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and I'm really intrigued to know in the comments as well. If you're watching on YouTube, give the video a thumbs up and let me know in the comments what you would answer to this question. If someone came in with a reasonable bid for Fabian Cher, let's say 12 to £15 million, pounds, given that he's out of contract next summer, would you cash in? I think it would have to be very seriously considered because he is at the stage of his career where not only is he going to have to be given a new contract, and I think he would be very open to a new contract. He's talked about the city of Newcastle being his second home for all that he's Swiss, and he, he, he said this is his second home. He's very comfortable here now. I think you would have to consider that. Because it's it's what's called business, isn't it? And we've got to remember this is a business. And, you know, if Newcastle could get money there, I mean, let's put it another way. They could bring in the right side at centre-half and he takes Fabian's position this season with Fabian still here. And then at the end of that this season, he's on the free transfer. So, you know, you would have to consider that. Every, every player has a shelf life. And, you know, we like it or not, we know the Fabian shelf life, we're three quarters of the way through it. We're not at the start of it, um, like you are with, um, I don't know, with Anderson and with very and with Kelly and with Lewis Hall and Livermento. You're not at the start, you're three quarters of the way through it. I mean, the interesting thing with Shaw, probably why people didn't fancy him at Newcastle and then uh, Eddie has is that um, Fabian Shaw, I mean, the, Fabian Shaw is a modern-day footballer. And, and the way the game is played now is perfect for him. Traditionally, England cent English centre-halves have been big bruisers for years. They've been physically strong. It's been a matter of, come on, I'll take you on, man. It's been the John McNamee situation. It's been the Harry Maguire situation. It's been the big tough guy. Okay, I'm desperate, Dan. I can bend steel bars in my teeth, etc., etc. Then you get what this guy is. You get the game evolving, and you get people wanting centre halves not just to defend, but to step out with the ball and use it. Now. The way this guy can ping a ball over 60 yards to a forward and it drops on a sixpence is quite incredible. I mean, he, the guy is elegance himself. He's, he's in footballing terms, he's much more Cary Grant or James Bond than he is Tyson Fury. And um, I think that is, that's nice and that's a modern game. And I don't necessarily say I want both my centre-offs like this. But I want one of elegance. I mean, if you go back far enough, and there's always people, and I'm just thinking on the hoof here, Andrew, there's always... We've had a lot recently about Alan Hansen, bless him, with the, the way he's been at Liverpool and them, um, you know. He was 
the Fabian Shaw of 20 years ago. Or Fabian Shaw is the new Alan Hansen. I mean, in those days, your centre-halves were, were people that, you know, bent crowbars. But then you had Alan Hansen, who, by the way, just going off at a tangent, when, when Joe Harvey had been this wonderful manager of Newcastle United for donkey's years where there was no relegations and there was regular silverware of some sort, including the best of the lot, Europe. And then he finished his manager and and Gordon Lee took over. Joe then become the chief scout. And Joe went up to Scotland and come back and said to Gordon Lee, I found you two top players. And Gordon Lee said, who are they? And he said, well, they're from Scotland. And he said, Gordon Lee said, I don't like Scottish League players. So we didn't sign them. And the two players that Joe had found that he wanted Newcastle to get was Alan Hansen, who I think was a part of this, who went down to Liverpool and become a legend. And the other one was Andy Gray, the centre forward. And then um, Joe, who was magnificent at finding players, they, there he did. He, he found the early Fabian Shaw, the player from the back who could play. Because Alan Hansen could play my job, he could. Fabian Shaw can. He is not the typical, as I say, he's Gary Grant, he's not Tyson Fury. Um, and he he is he fits the modern day criteria of what a defender should be. And you you touched on it before. And by the way, it's set pieces. How often have we said Newcastle United in the past have not scored enough goals on set pieces with their central defenders? going up onto corners and whatever. Fabian Shaw is excellent at that. Uh, he's had 15 uh, Premier League goals for Newcastle or 15 goals overall for Newcastle. He's had 15 in his career as a centre-half. And one of, you know what, we talked last season about the great Newcastle goals, Andrew, and we, we had 25 of them. And if about five were penalties, there's the rest which was sheer elegance, passing the ball in the net from Isaac and all the others. I tell you what, the, his goal against Paris Saint-Germain, which you mentioned, was as good as it gets, you know. What a finish that was. That was a centre-forwards finish from a centre-half. Uh, and that wasn't a towering header on a corner. That was a, that was a quality finish, and that emphasises the ability that Fabian Shaw has got. Yeah, he doesn't know. It doesn't. It doesn't half know how to hit a, a, a oh. ball. Does he score some absolute worldies? That's him on the phone now, saying thank you, John, for all your kind <laughs> words. Yes, I um, think it probably is. <laughs> but it is interesting that you mention all his attributes because it's going to take something to replace him, isn't it? Like you know, he the way he plays with the ball, he's so comfortable on it. The way he brings it out, and if you don't approach him within 10, 10 12 yards, he's just going to keep on going and going and going. He can beat players, as you said. He can pick the the pass out, and he can't put it into the back of the net. So, to get someone of his ability is not going to be an easy task, or as I've mentioned, a cheap task, is it? No, no, it's not. But funny enough, and there's always hope, you know, with with us all. Funny enough, I think Lloyd Kelly will look like that. I know he's on the other side of the centre halves, but he can step out with the ball. He can come out with the ball and look comfortable and not look a centre-half. How often do we say in general play, and not just with Newcastle, with any Premier League side or England, oh, that was a centre-half shot, when somebody just whacks the ball, slices it, knocks the hat off the bloke at the back of the goal, the, the spectator, that's a centre-half shot. This fella can ping the ball about. Kelly, I think, can do that as well. So that will be a hell. But of course, we take re replacing on the right hand side. And we've got to replace him. I mean, we haven't got Lascelles until the back end of the year anyway. But he is, and he can play right side. But he, he, he's not the greatest. We've, we've already gone beyond uh, Jamal, who is a lovely squad player in the way that Murphy is, but is no longer... I mean, he was the linchpin at the back for Newcastle and the, the skipper. But we've improved greatly from that in the days it's got, we've gone on beyond ourselves. And, you know, we'll go on beyond Shaw. We, we'll have to. If we're going to win 
the Premier League title in the next 10 years and if we're going to be regularly in the Champions League and perhaps and start to win trophies uh, domestically from next season, then we've got to move on from virtually everybody we've got now. But we've all got to be thankful for having Shaw and we've all got to be grateful for the way that he has come out of his shell in the last couple of seasons because the team has come out of its shell and he's been encouraged. I can't emphasise enough how the game is mental as well as physical, Andrew. Um, players, I mean, I even when I was at Gateshead uh, as chairman and owner for 11 years, even at that level, you can see the difference in a player when you talk to him, when you put confidence, confidence in him, when you believe in him. A guy that looked a very average player suddenly looks pretty good player. And we had that at Gateshead and much bigger and much more important. We've seen it happen at Newcastle. And equally, you can destroy players. I mean, if we talk about the mental situation, Andrew, just going off at a tangent, and England are playing in the Euros at the moment. What about Rashford? When he was full of, of confidence, when he was full of belief, when the managers loved him, when everything was right in his private life, and etc., etc., what a player he looked. He looks now as if he's got all the, the, the woes of the world on his shoulders. And, you know, he's out of the England situation. Has he got a Manchester United future? That's all... That's not injuries. That's not injuries taking the edge off a player because he hasn't had life, uh, career-threatening injuries. That is confidence. And the other way on, the confidence has poured through Fabian Shaw in the last two seasons. Hmm. Yeah, no, 100% agree. And that's the impact of Eddie Howe believing in him. But as you said, the player has to believe in himself as well. And, and Fabian Shaw certainly isn't a man who lacks uh, self-belief, I don't think. You mentioned uh, Lloyd Kelly coming in, and I spoke to a Bournemouth uh, podcaster for an episode which will go out on Saturday, I think I've penciled it in for. And it's funny because he talks about Lloyd Kelly as being a, a first-choice left-back, and I think all the conversations I've had with Newcastle fans is that he would be the left-sided centre-back, which shows his versatility. But my question to you, John, is... How important is that left-sided centre-back for Fabian Scher's form? So, Lloyd Kelly might be the man. It was Sven Botman before the injury. Dan Byrne, towards the end of last season, looked monumental alongside Fabian Scher. Them two struck up a really good partnership, even though it does lack a bit of pace. How important is it that Eddie Howe gets that left-sided centre-back pick right so Fabian Scher can continue his great form? I mean, you're right. At the end of the season, uh, Shaw and Byrne looked terrific. But before his injury, Shaw and Botman looked terrific. Not while Botman was struggling with that injury. He was a, You couldn't recognise the player uh, just before he went out the side. But Shaw and Botman were superb and become close friends and, and was right. Uh, you've got to have teams about partnerships. Just the definition of it, it, it's a team game. It's not an individual game, it's a team game. And people have got to go right together. They've got to form a partnership. They've got to form an understanding. They've got to produce the balance. For goodness sake, look at England. The balance is so wrong in midfield where they've got four or five great world-class players and they don't... How do you use Bellingham? Do you let him go free? How do you use Rice? Do you curtail him a little bit? What do you do with Foden, Premier League Player of the Year, who was very poor in England's first game? Would you be better off with Anthony Gordon? The balance is wrong in midfield for England. It was wrong when we had the golden generation, where they wanted to just shoehorn all the good players in, and Paul Scholes ended up playing outside left, which was a, a waste of, of, of unique talent. And so the partnership of people has got to be right. And, you know, I'm hoping, and at the moment, that partnership at centre-half with Shaw, Botman's out of it until Christmas, so he's physically, we forget him. It, it's whether it's going to be Byrne or whether it's going to be Kelly. And I think I mentioned on one of our previous uh, podcasts, Andrew, that what New, Newcastle had a very bad defensive record last season. Haven't had a very good one the season before. 
And one of the reasons why, and there was many, but one of them is we haven't got pace at the back. We get taken through lack of pace. We can get exposed. Once it, once a forward's got off the shoulder of the last defender, he's not going to get caught by anybody in this back four. But he is going to get caught by Kelly. And I think that's part of the, the, the attraction of Kelly to Eddie Howe. There's many attractions, but pace. And Shaw will benefit by having that pace. You know what it is? It's like taking out an insurance policy. If you're Shaw, you're thinking, I can commit. I can go in tight on the bloke there. I can come out with a ball. Because if somebody gets behind me, Kelly's going to catch him. Um, whereas if somebody gets behind me last season, who's going to catch him? Burns not going to catch him, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it... it I think one of the great attractions for Eddie with Kelly is the fact he's got pace, and that will help Shaw. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, it certainly will do, and as the return of Nick Port will do as well. I'm going Absolutely. to ask you, John, um, a final question in a moment, but I'd, we, 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 we begun this uh, show, this episode, by asking whether we think Fabian Cech could get a new deal and you know finish his career at Newcastle United. And he was asked about that very scenario not too long ago. And he said, I would love to. You said what the situation is. I have said now how much I love the club and how much I want to be here so I don't have to say anything else. There was a time when I was thinking about what could happen, i.e. leaving. I was in a difficult situation. I didn't know if the club was still there for me, that they still wanted me. But as soon as the new manager came in, I thought this is my chance. Since then, everything has changed. Um, then he was asked um, about the Champions League and said he, you know, he wouldn't even think about playing the Champions League at that point. We were in a different stage. I played the first three or four years at Newcastle fighting relegation, which is very different. This makes it even better to still be at the club that I love. This is the best time of my career playing in the best league. I feel like this is my second home. I've been here over five years. I feel really confident. The city and the club have given me a lot and I want to give something back to see the fans, these good times they deserve. Now, he seems very open to finishing his career on Tyneside. I just wonder, because as I mentioned, he does come across as a little bit arrogant. Does Fabian Chen look a good-looking chap? He knows he's probably got a career in finance to come afterwards. So, he, you know, he's got a few reasons to be a little bit uh, confident in, in what's to come in life for him. Would he accept, though, do you think, John, a new deal, but if it meant him playing, you know, just in the cup games or being on the bench and coming off, would you think he would accept getting demoted, for want of a better phrase, to the bench? Yeah, I mean, Matt Ritchie accepted it. Jamal Lascelles accepted it. At this stage of his career, I think that... I, I don't mean that he would like it, and I think he would fight against it, and that's what you want from a player. But I think he would accept it. I mean, where would he go that's any better? If at the end of this season and his contract is run out, and it won't have done because if, if he's staying, they'll do the deal during the season... But if we qualified for the Champions League or for Europe, do you think do you think Charles want to leave that and go and play for some obscure side in Switzerland or in France or bottom of the Premier League or top of the Championship? I think he's better off being a squad player at Newcastle, and um, if if that is the situation, and um, so. I mean, I hesitate when we use the words very loosely of will he finish his career at Newcastle and as if, if he gets a new contract uh, now, he'll be 33 when he when he got it, as if that means he finishes his career at Newcastle because Matt Ritchie and Paul Dummett's not going to finish their career at Newcastle because they're going to play next season somewhere on a free transfer. So it doesn't mean he won't wear any of their colours if he gets another contract here, um, but it does mean that his big time uh, uh, career is finished here, as Matt Ritchie's big time career is finished at Newcastle, because wherever he goes, it'll not be big time compared with what it was here. But um, I can see him staying and I can see him being happy to stay, because when you become realistic, you suddenly think, if I leave Newcastle, where am I going to go? And you know the, the, the first answer? Downwards. Because mm. you're not... I mean, if if 
Bruno leaves Newcastle, you could argue he could go upwards because he could go to a regular Champions League side or a side like Man City that's going to win the title. But if you leave at Fabian's stage, you're going to go slightly downwards. The only reason to leave would be, apart from them not wanting you, would be if you wanted to play regularly as opposed to playing occasionally. We could be doing him a total disservice, though, as well. There's no reason why he couldn't hold this position in the first team for, for many years to come. As we've seen with players, uh, you know, they go on a lot longer than they, they used to and at the top of the, the Premier League as well. So, no I mean, reason why... No, you're right, Andrew. There's, no, there's nothing that's showing rust. There's nothing that's telling you this is getting towards the end for this particular player. And I've seen that time and again in other players where you can see the rust almost coming on match by match. He is not at that stage. There's no reason to suspect because a law he sort of seems to go down every game and have to have the physio on to look at him. He doesn't miss a lot of games. Look at he's played 36 out of 38 in the last two seasons. He's missed elegance. He always looks to have that split second on the ball longer than other players have. There's nothing, you're absolutely right to point it out, there's nothing at this moment to say that if we buy a right-sided centre-half, he can still turn out to be the best one this coming season and, and have a, another couple of years. He's not 34 or 35 or going on 36. He, he's, he's 32. So, yes, there's no reason to suspect and he hasn't looked vulnerable. It's just when Newcastle are in the position they're in, you must push every player to get the best out of them and to let them know there's no comfort zone at Newcastle. Newcastle and United are going places and to go places, we're going to have two quality players in each position. That's the hope. That is definitely the hope. And as we mentioned there, you know, Lloyd Kelly coming in could really uh, prolong Fabian Scher's place in this first uh, team because of the speed Kelly brings. The final question, John, that I want to ask you is, is Fabian Scher Newcastle United's best ever bargain? So they signed him from Deportivo La Coruña for £3 million. Since then, 188 appearances, 15 goals, 7 assists. We've talked about how good he is. We've talked about what he's still got to offer. Is he Newcastle's best ever bargain? You can make out a, a terrific case for him, and um, I don't see why not. I was going to the Newcastle met his buyout clause. It was only three million, and he's played 188 games for us. He's got his fourth top of the Premier League. He's played in the Champions League and scored a sensational win at uh, a sensational final goal at the top of the win over Paris Saint-Germain. He's absolutely fabulous. Talking off the top of my head, um, the only thing that leaps to mind is is signing Peter Beardsley twice for peanuts. Once from Vancouver and once to come back, I think it was from Everton or wherever, the second time with the entertainers. And, well, I mean, he's a Rolls Royce. Uh, so, I mean, he is, he, he, this can be the best pound for pound signing we've had since him because he's so cheap. And uh, that's terrific. He, and therefore, you will always have a position in the heart of Geordies and in the, the situation at, um, at Newcastle United because he is, he's brought a touch of Cary Grant to Newcastle United. And we've, we all want to be Cary Grant or James Bond, don't we? And and he is being exactly that. He even looks the part, doesn't he? I mean, he, he, he actually looks the part. If, if there's a career after playing for Newcastle, it might be, be being James Bond. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, just some of then, in a sentence, John, <laughs> Fabian Chair at Newcastle United, you know, what do we get? We got elegance personified, and however much Geordies love big hearts and guys who will run through brick walls and will cut people down and will show how much they love. We like elegance. We like a certain swagger. We like players that can play and know they can play. Um, we like people that respond to what Newcastle United mean and get what Jodies mean. Fabian Shaw is the elegant Swiss guy. 
he's coming here and he's coming to a working class city with and he's immediately got what Newcastle United means and what Jordies mean and whatever. And his confidence has grown so much and he's so grateful for the second half of his Newcastle United career when he got people to believe in him and got good players around him and could blossom instead of walk, walking in an uncertain world. And he's produced so much for Newcastle. I'm absolutely grateful. I tell you, I used to look at him in the old regime and think, there's an elegant player, but there's a mistake. He was both elegant and a walking mistake. He isn't now. He's just elegant. And isn't that the best thing to be? I mean, you almost think that he, he could play in a dicky bow tie, in a, in a zoot suit, don't you? Um, because he looks like that. And you almost think, so, you know, I bet when we put the shirts in the wash, we don't have to put uh, Fabian's in because he's Mr. Cool. He, he hasn't got filthy dirty, but he's capable of doing that. He actually defends with elegance and, and, and with the ability not to look as if he's gone to ground every tackle and that it's a desperate last minute tackle he has brought he has brought Champions League swagger to Newcastle before the Champions League arrived at Newcastle and you can't pay a greater compliment to a player than to say that about him yeah he's been absolutely fantastic at Newcastle and hopefully plenty more to come from Fabian Scher this has been everything is black and white talk. Uh, this has been everything is black and white podcast. Let's talk about Fabian Share with me, Andrew Musgrove, and John Gibson. And for me and John, we will see you guys very soon. <laughs>